I know what you're all thinking. This girl again? Uh, you can either thank or um, berate Arnaud uh, later, depending on your feelings. Um, but I'm here today uh, just to tell you a little bit about the work that I've been doing for the past six years related to concussion and traumatic brain injury sustained in sport and particularly in American football. So first, just a bit of brief overview of what I'm going to talk to you about. What is a concussion? Why does it matter? And what might be the health effects of repetitive brain injury or concussion as sustained through sport? So a concussion is a brain injury, plain and simple. It's a brain injury that's caused by acceleration and then deceleration of the head or body. It can be caused through sport. It can be caused through a car accident. It can be caused through a fall. Today, we're talking about American football. A concussion is a widespread brain injury. It's a brain injury that affects diffuse portions of the brain. It's not a bleed on the brain. It's not something that you can see with traditional neuroimaging or brain scans. It's a metabolic injury, an injury that affects the way the brain cells work. And so when you think about what happens in American football, athletes lining up against each other, hitting each other head on head, every play of every practice and every game, you can imagine that they may sustain a number of these brain injuries. Oh geez, go back. Apologies. So, how many concussions actually happen? In the United States, the Center for disease control estimates that between 1.6 and 3.8 million concussions happen annually just as a result of sport and recreational activity. That includes a huge number of youth and adolescent athletes who participate in sport. A large fraction of them unfortunately end up sustaining concussion. Over 65% of the emergency department visits in youth and adolescents in 5 to 18 year olds are a result of a, a brain injury. This matters because during this period of time, athletes, children, their brains are still developing. And this may actually be an underestimate as concussion is an invisible injury. It's an injury that you cannot see using neuroimaging. It's an injury that sometimes you cannot see from outside as an outside observer. But it is an injury that affects the brain in a profound way. Can we play this video? With sound, please. Oh. No? Maybe not. Still stopping. Go, move! Oh, oh my go. gosh! <laughs> so those Still are. Still stopping. Go, move! Oh, oh my gosh! So you get the idea. Those are six and seven year old football players in the United States performing a drill that's totally unnecessary, but that obviously can result in brain injury. Now, when we talk about brain injury from sport, the most recent scientific data suggests that we shouldn't only be thinking about concussion, about a hit that causes symptoms, but rather we should be thinking about the repetitive nature of hitting the head as you do in American football. So what's called subconcussive blows. Blows that result from an activity such as football that have adequate g-force to affect the brain on a cellular level, but don't result in immediate symptoms. Some positions within American football, linemen for example, those who line up and face each other every single play, have over 1,000 hits of this type each season. Hits that have the equivalent of running into a car running into a wall at 35 miles an hour or 55 kilometers per hour. You can imagine that those would add up and that those may have the potential to create cumulative problems down the line. In fact, a very large study of former retired NFL football players fi finds that it does. Former pro professional football players have much higher rates of neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. 
somewhere in about the four times higher range for all of these neuropathological uh, disorders. In the lab that I worked at for four years at Boston University, we studied one particular disorder that can result from repetitive brain injury. It's called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is a mouthful. We call it CTE. It's a neurodegenerative disease. You don't have to be a brain expert to look at those slides and see that something is wrong. It results from the accumulation of a protein in the brain, a protein that is normally there to help stabilize the brain cells, but with all of the repetitive injury, gets knocked loose, changes in chemical formation, and clogs up the brain cells effectively. So this is what a normal 65-year-old human would look like on the left. Again, you don't have to be a neuroscientist to see that on the right-hand side, we have problems. We have problems that are resulting in a number of symptoms, and I'm just gonna discuss one case with you briefly so we get an idea of what this, brain, what this brain issue does to the human. So Dave Dorson died at age 50. He was a professional football player, primarily with the Chicago Bears. He had uh, a long NFL career. He began football at age eight. And after he finished his 11-year NFL career, he was a successful businessman. He was actually on the NFL Players Association Committee, uh, distributing uh, benefits to some of the players in need. But he began having difficulties, financial difficulties, business difficulties. He was increasingly irrational, had a short fuse, became angered, impulsive, verbally and physically abusive to his wife, and this was out of character. After worsening difficulties, Dave Dorson took his own life. He shot himself in the chest and left a note saying, I want my brain to be studied by the NFL Brain Bank. And this is what we found. Dave Dorson had stage three out of four chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. He had profound disease in his brain a disease that has only been known to be associated with repetitive brain trauma. So this is where I think we leave the discussion, this cartoon. I read that story about dementia in former NFL players. Maybe we should reconsider this. Thank you. Muchas gracias a Christine. Que nos da una perspectiva muy, muy clara de lo que pasa y las repercusiones que tiene en tema de salud para jugadores de la NFL, un tema investigado desde hace mucho tiempo, el doctor Bennett Omalu, es el hombre que estaba retratado por Will Smith en, en esa película. Y le doy la palabra a Joe Beregia para que nos platique un poco las marcas que están asociadas a la NFL, cómo tratan cuando se habla de su producto o de un producto al que están asociados, cómo, cómo lidian con esto, cómo se percibe en el entorno, Joe, te dejo platicar sobre este tema que obviamente atañe a todas las marcas que están alrededor del NFL, como Arrow en este caso. Well, thank you. So Arrow Electronics is one of those large global companies that you probably have never heard of, uh, but we're 23 billion dollars in annual revenue, 18,000 employees and we span the entire electronics industry. We're located in Denver, Colorado, and we have offices all around the world. Uh, and we are, a we are a major sponsor of the Denver Broncos football team, uh, Super Bowl champions, and uh, we are a technology partner with the NFL. So this topic is of great concern to us. At the same time, like most major Fortune 500 companies in the United States, football is part of how we do business. Uh, we have the biggest corporate party room at the stadium right next door to the owner's box, and we can have up to 60 people 
60 customers and their guests at every game with a full buffet of food and a full bar and, and we make a day of it and business is done during that day. It's a very important part of how we do our business and our customers expect it. And to give you a little bit more perspective on what football means in America and what it means to corporate brands like Arrow and others, um, the audience for this year's Super Bowl was an average of 116 million viewers with a top viewership during the game of 167 million people. That means one out of every two people in America was tuned into that game, one out of every two. Uh, the Super Bowl ads, many people watch them you know, as much to see the good advertisements and the creative advertisements as the uh, game itself. That's up to $10 million a minute now in terms of what you pay the NFL and the network to have your ad on the Super Bowl. And a little later today, I'll be showing you our ad that played on the Super Bowl because it relates to most of my work. Uh, but so big dollars are at stake, big audiences are at stake, and during the halftime, by the way, that's the single largest use of water in the United States because those 167 million people all go to the bathroom at the same time, and, and that's, the one, that's the one time where water, the water consumption in the United States is astonishing. So there is, there is enormous impact throughout the United States about football, both in terms of our culture and in terms of our business. Uh, and so this concussion issue puts us, and especially someone like me, in a uh, difficult position because I am in charge of corporate social responsibility at Arrow, and that means that on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm in charge of uh, our relationships and our projects on humanitarian projects with nonprofit partners. Uh, but I'm also one of the few people at Arrow that's really always concerned about our reputation. And so now that this concussion issue is in the news, the subject of very high quality medical research and public health research, uh, and also the subject of a Hollywood movie, we know there's a problem. And how do we reconcile the growing issue with how we need to conduct our business?